there's two kinds of people in this world, in my estimation. There's those that know love and those that don't know love. The ability to know what love is comes with a baby. In the street, we knew as soon as somebody had a kid, basically their career was over. Because all of a sudden, they felt. I did not know love until Elena was born. No clue. Not even, not even the love for my wife. Nothing compared to the look that I got from Elena. Nothing compared to the sound of her calling me daddy. I remember the first time she called me daddy. Hmm. When she was about 14 months old, I took her to the zoo and she decided that was her time to scratch my face with two hands. Remember, Elena? <laughs> Me and Joy took her to Metro Zoo, and if you've ever been to Metro Zoo, that's a long, hot day. And a 14, 15-month-old baby. Well, at one point, she just striped my face with her nails. <laughs> and I just smiled. She said, I love this kid, even when she's scratching me. You also don't really know what pain is until you see it live through your child. Nothing, nothing can prepare your heart more for love and pain like a child. You just don't. And it doesn't matter, listen, young folk here, when I tell you you don't know, you don't know. And I'll tell you why you don't know. Because until, as a child, you play that cold game on your parents, that whatever, and you walk out on them when they're trying to talk to you, when trying to reason with you, when they're trying to reach you, you don't know the dagger, the, the pain, when your parents are looking at you and they're trying to explain to you what's right for you and what's don't do that. It won't end well. The Bible calls it taking counsel in your own soul. Children up to 20 plus years old are really good at taking counsel in their own soul. I'm going to do this. Why? Because I feel like it. It's not going to end up good for you. Listen, it hasn't ended up good for anybody. And you're not going to be the first one. There is no... You, you, the kids, they look and they see the other kids having so much fun. They're getting drunk and they're getting high and they're having sex and they're just enjoying themselves. No, they're not. They're in as, just as much pain as you are. And a hangover and guilt and shame, that's not society's construct. That's real. That's your spirit yielding inside, checking inside. And your parents, they see it, and it hurts so bad. And you can't stop your child from screwing up their own life. And there's nothing that can prepare you for that. Nothing. You think you know what pain is, like you had a dog that died or a friend? Nothing. Zero. But again, the love that you have for your child. When you, when the Lord Jesus said, no greater love hath than this, than he who lay down his life for his friend, that takes effort. If you have a friend and like, you will lay down your life. That takes effort. Let me tell you something. True love, it's effortless. There is no... Nicole, you take a bullet for one of your kids? There's 
not like, let me think on that a second. Like one of your friends, your high school best friend needs a liver. You're like, you know what, let me ponder this a second. Is there any money in it? Are they going to leave a house for my kid if I die? If you had to live in pain so that your child wouldn't, you wouldn't even. As a parent, you wouldn't even. You don't understand, young folk, the pain that an adult feels when a child uses the love that you have for them against you. Love. So when we read today's Bible study and we start talking about this love, I have to tell you something. I've never loved my wife until she had my child. She's telling you like it is. I have to give you two caveats. First caveat is if you are here and you are a barren person, you're, you never had children, you know, listen, I'm not saying you don't know what love is. I'm just saying you don't know what this type of love is. I'm not saying you've missed out on I don't want you to man, feel bad. Don't do that. Let's, let's rejoice for something else without you know, putting ourselves in that position of victim. Hat said, caveat number two, I expected this. Today, here's today's Bible study. My wife is supposed to be sitting there and say, baby, come here. And everybody's going to watch my beautiful bride walk down the aisle. I was going to sit her here. And I was going to say, the only way I can do this Bible study, honey bun, especially the day before Valentine's Day, is by looking at you while I read this. Because any other way I read it, it's going to really, I'm going to sound like a sick, twisted pervert. I am. I'm sorry, I am. I've never studied this book before, guys. This is the first time I've ever actually had to do a deep study in this book, and we, we've explained it, and that's why I'm kind of, apologies, rushed through it. We did it in just a few weeks, because metaphorically speaking here, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't want to be talking about at church. Talk about it at home with your wife, your husband. But having said that, the love that we can, again, metaphorically use that maybe this is one of, the, one of the ways we spiritualize. And if you weren't here the first week we studied this book, I apologize. Get the tape. I'll explain spiritualizing a text. I don't want to do that all again. That's a 10-minute discussion. But one of the ways we spiritualize a text, we said, you know, this book is like a love letter written to God's people. And as they read it, it could be God speaking to them. And you'd have to strain out some of the pits, but that's okay. But the love that God has for us, we know that He knows what love is. Because He had a child that was murdered. And that kid didn't have to be murdered. That's pretty, that's pretty, you know, it's one thing. uh, If they came to me and they said, listen, we're going to, um, we're going to take your son Josiah and we're going to kill him. But don't worry, everybody else in the world is going to have the ability to be saved. I'd be like, sucks for them. (laughs) No. It's my only son, my only begotten son. Can't have him. But what if it's good for everybody else? Sucks for them. So the love that God has for us poured out in these words with a sincerity that exists. It's interesting. Think about a few of the ways that we spiritualize a text from week one. As I read to my wife sitting right there, not sitting there. 
The daughters of Jerusalem say to the Shulamite, Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone to his garden, the Shulamite replies, to the beds of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Then the beloved says, O my love, you are as beautiful as Tirzah, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Every one bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. The only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines, they praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome? as an army with banners. Please give me your attention. If you were to break this down and describe one by one, this is what's called enraptured. If you've never been enraptured with somebody, I pity you, and I hope someday you are. I am, after 30 years, enraptured with my wife. Her hair drives me crazy. The smell of the nape of her neck is so intoxicating to me. You see, it says there, I love, I love this line. He, he says here, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. When, when my wife looks at me sometimes, there's this look in her I always could tell what my wife's feeling by the look in her eyes. If her eyes are cut, I'm in trouble. If they're big and round, Like a little boy. I am. To think that that's how God thinks about us. You know, this is really difficult to do, but I want you to remind, I, I want to remind you something. The Bible says that you are the apple of his eye. The Bible actually insinuates in a few different parables that if you are the only one who is going to receive salvation, he would have still died for you. Some of you guys have been used, abused, misused, violated, defiled. And you know what God thinks about that? He says, I love you so much. It is so... To think that you turn God on by loving him back. I want to remind you something, and please stay with me with a pure heart here. We are um, trying to remove some of the filth from our hearts. That Christ is a picture of marriage. Or should I say our marriage is a metaphor or a type of Christ and the church. Christ is the, the, the husband. The church is the bride. And in worship... When we were sitting here worship, and all I did was worship, oh, you know what I mean? That is the metaphorically, wow, what was that? Oh my goodness, I thought that light broke. And that thing flew about six foot in the air. <laughs> metaphorically speaking, worship is a type of, there, there is no actual word for it, except it's the sex. Now, please stay with me. When you are worshiping God, you are having a spiritual, holy intercourse with your Savior. Take away all of the filth and the disgusting of, of everything that's in your mind when it comes to pornography or intercourse from the world's perspective. There is the purity, the holiness 
And, and, and that is the way we feel about God and God feels about us when we worship him. Now, I know for some that's really hard to handle because your only picture of sex has always been filthy. You know, testimony-wise, come on. Most of us here weren't pure. We had our experiences. But I'll tell you this now, and this you young people listen to. I'd give up every one of those experiences to offer myself to my wife pure. Every one of them. They mean nothing to me anymore. Zero. They're a hindrance in my life. They're a hindrance in my life. If you can't pray with your spouse while you're making love, then maybe your sex isn't as holy as it should be. Just a thought there. If this is a spiritualizing the text, a picture of Christ, the way he feels about us, taking away all of the sexual metaphors, man, God really digs us, man. Who is she who looks forth as the morning Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. That's what God thinks about you. That's pretty cool. What makes it cooler is I don't deserve it. And he gives that to me anyway. Man. I know this is hard, guys. It's, it's hard because we're filthy. I went down, the Shulamite now answers and says, I went down to the garden of nuts to see the verdure of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. And then the beloved and uh, his friends retort, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. My wife went away. She took my grandson back to my daughter in North Carolina. My other son-in-law and my, uh, my daughter have moved from uh, one part of North Carolina to another. He got a new job. And uh, we were watching my son-in-law for... My, my son-in-law. We were watching my grandson for a week. And she brought him back. And I don't know about you guys, but the first day, I kind of dig being alone. Get up in the morning, I got the whole bed to myself. I was okay the first day. Around about hour 15, though. <laughs> return, return, O Shulamite, return that I may look upon you. How many of you guys here, don't raise your hand, it doesn't matter. How many of you guys are FaceTime people? You never call each other anymore, you just FaceTime. Mike is like that. Tarzan, Mike, the real Tarzan. You do that? That's what you do? I, you know, I just call people. Hello, I text. I'm, I like texting people. But some people, like, they're, they're, they, they're, like, they're always FaceTiming. They'd be driving, and you'd be like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, let's, uh, let's not die while we're talking. <laughs> that would be really bad. I'm not like that. Just text me. Baby, how are you? Good. You know, safe landings? Yeah. Can I call you? Eh, I'm a little busy. Call me later. By hour 16, I was FaceTiming her every 15 minutes. What would you see in the Shulamite, as it were? The dance of two camps? Speaking about herself, what do you see when you look at me? I hate that about women. I hate that. All women think they're ugly. They all think they're fat and ugly and nasty. And nobody's going to want them. I hate that. All I see when I look at my wife is beauty. I see nothing else. There's nothing else. My wife's like, honey, do I look fat in this? Like, you have to be fat to look fat, babe.
Ken Graves tells a funny joke. He says, when your wife says, honey, do I look fat in this? The correct answer is not, I've seen fatter. <laughs> what do you see when you look at the Shulamite? Now, for some of you guys here, this might be falling a little flat. Let's go back to relationship aspect of it. Maybe you're not enraptured with your, with your spouse, with your, your love. Man, pray for it. Guys, if you knew how sick it is to be around Brian and Magdy just for five minutes... <laughs> It's about half as sick as being around Arlie and Andrew. I am so disgusted. <laughs> Arlie tries to hide it from me, and she does such a terrible job. Ugh. I love it. Then he looks at his... Beloved again, his wife again, and he says, how beautiful are your feet and sandals. Now, you know that's some love when you like the woman's foot. <laughs> Think about it. I don't know if you're a foot man or not. Maybe you're a shoe guy, because this guy was a shoe guy. Man, look at them feet and them sandals. <laughs> Give me some high heel pumps or something, some big seven inches, you know. My wife, sometimes she wears them high heels. She looks me right now. I'm like, man, look at that woman's so big. Tall, I mean tall. You just called me fat. I didn't call you fat. I said tall. I said, you said big. I didn't mean big. That's how guys say tall. <laughs> Night's over. That's it. Over. <laughs> Done. <laughs> oh, Prince's daughter. I got, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. The curves, of your th the curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is like a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. <laughs> I'm telling you, the woman was supposed to be sitting there. If you're at home watching this, you got a cold on purpose just to embarrass me. Can I not read the Bible? <laughs> your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. <laughs> you two press like phones the turns gazelle. <laughs> Your neck is like an ivory tower. I didn't skip it, I read it real fast. You just didn't hear it. <laughs> Your neck is like an ivory that's like a that's a compliment. <laughs> Your neck is like an ivory tower. There you go. What was the last card you seen with that in it? Your eyes like the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabbim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. I have no idea what that means. I mean, Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, and the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. Purple back then was another word that, that, that wasn't purple. as like the color purple when uh, uh, royalty always wore purple. Purple was silk of the day. That's what silk was. Pur oh, that's purple. That's, that was this long, flowing silk. And you guys know what tresses are, right? That's hair. How fair and how pleasant are you, O oh love, with your delights. The stature of yours is like a palm tree. Your breast like his clusters. I said I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Why do I feel like I'm singing like a Joe, what's his name, song? Space Cowboy? 
Really love your peaches, want to shake your treat kind of thing? Steve Miller, man. Steve Miller, thank you. Let now your breast be like questions to find. <laughs> the fragrance of your breath is like apples. You know, it's good to see that bad breath has always been bad breath. Halitosis is just halitosis. <laughs> didn't smell good then, didn't smell good now. Like back then, they didn't have like toothbrushes. Like, you know what you need to do? Eat an apple or something, okay? Even that's a step in the right direction, <laughs> okay? Where's somebody who invented a toothbrush? <laughs> Just cleans out your mouth. The roof of your mouth, like the best wine. I'm down with that. The wine, now, now the Shulamite says, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. I am my beloved. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Let me tell you something, ladies. I mean, brothers, there's nothing better than to let your woman know you are her desire. And I've heard many people say the things that they do in order to spice up their life. You want to spice up your life? Let your woman think that you only have eyes for her. Let me reiterate that. Let her know that. Whatever it is that you're watching, engaging in, participating about, nothing can turn her on more than for her heart to know you and only you. Anything else is a lie. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early. You know what's funny here? You know what's great? Women and men have not changed. Look at the dude. He's like, really love your peaches, want to shake your tree? And look at the chick. Let's go get a hotel on the beach and walk down the block. You see the difference here? Look at her. She's like, let's go to the field and let's lodge in the village. Let's get up early and go to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine budded, whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom. After that, I'll give you my love. <laughs> We have to, can't we just like stay home and watch a movie? No. We're going to go and we're going to get a hotel on the beach. We're going to have a nice dinner. We're going to go for a walk on the beach. And if you behave after dessert, I will give you my love. The mandrakes give off a fragrance. And at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old which I have laid up for you, my beloved. You see, that's a woman that knows how to turn her man on. Dog, I got food prepared back at the place. That's it. See what she said there? The mandrakes, that's a type of cake. That's, that's a, um, actually, they used to think that a mandrake was uh, aphrodisiac. They give off a fragrance, and at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. Yeah. That's it. When we get back to the house, food. Let's do it. That woman knew how to get her husband. It's that simple. Hey, ladies, it's not really hard. The, the whole thing here, you want to keep your man? Food and sex. Sit. That's it. You cut off one or the other, you've just lost a relationship. Now, you guys might think, man, that's not funny. That's, that's, not, that's not a joke. I ain't joking. You don't know how to cook? Learn. And if you don't know how to cook, learn. <laughs> Talk to your mama. Talk to a friend. They can teach you how to cook. That's what sisters are for. I'm joking, but I'm sincere at the same time. Oh, that's right. That's an old saying. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. 
And my wife used to say, and if you mess up, the way to your heart is through your stomach. <laughs> oh yeah, my wife don't play that. Oh, that you were like my brother who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She who used to instruct me, I would cause you to drink of spiced wine, of the juice of my pomegranate. Back then, it was a very important thing to marry inside your family. Now, through the ages of the biblical times, guys, please understand this. Adam and Eve had two sons, the first two. Anybody remember? Cain and Abel. Where did Cain's wife come from? It was one of his sisters. Ew, that's disgusting. Back then, it wasn't. And it might sound disgusting, but let me explain to you something here. The genetic strain of your bloodline right now is so watered down. The genetic information that is offered right now in your DNA is weakened because of this. But there was no option back then except this. And because the DNA strain was strong, there was no such thing as inbreeding back then. Now, at each stage in biblical times, you could find through the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, and the book of Deuteronomy, you can find that the Jews now were no longer to be. Find somebody who is now your sister from the beginning, your cousin from the end, outside your village. Each place. Back then it was considered, listen, you don't marry outside your family. Well, that's nasty. Back then it wasn't. You found a second or third cousin. You found your uncle's daughter, your uncle's daughter's son, something like that. That was how you kept... Guys, if you go to a... Um, I want to say a third world country, a less um, colonized country, a less colonized nation, you'll see that the people all look alike. Like when I went to Brazil, I went to Copacabana and Rio, you cannot believe how many people look. Man, I know that dude. No, that's not him, man. He's, he's back. It's crazy. When you go to Egypt, I've got some friends in Egypt. They look, it's amazing. I mean, you, you, you think about King Tut, the, the picture of him. Man, they all still look like that. I'm, I'm serious. It's crazy. Certain towns and different, they all look alike because of that. And now that's not a, to us because, listen, America's only been colonized for 200 plus years now. And all these people came from Europe. All these people came from Africa. All these people. And now that's why you've got this beautiful mixture. I mean, we've used her as an example before. Uh, righteous is a perfect example of the future of our nation. In just 100 years, if, they should, if, if the Lord should tarry, the vast majority of the people are going to have a, 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 a cafe con leche colored skin. <laughs> because now, it's okay. How you talk to Matt about his growing up? It was scandalous, wasn't it? You married a white dude? Girl, you crazy? You can't find some of your own color? It's the same thing for my parents. My father's Sicilian, my mother's Jewish, and my father was, if you guys remember, he's dark skinned. He was a whole lot, a lot darker than you. My mother was just lily white. I was like, oh my goodness. You marry us. You don't marry an Italian. You know what the point is? Let's get over those things. Let's not worry about that stuff anymore. But back then, this way, I don't know how I got off on such a tangent. The daughters of Jerusalem, my favorite part of this whole Bible study. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And here's the visual I get in here, right? Finally, she sees her beloved. He takes her right hand and he wraps it around her head, takes her left, uh, her body, takes her left hand, wraps it around, and he dips her. Here's the dip. 
and he's looking deep in her eyes and he's about to kiss her. And just before his lips meet hers, she goes, don't do this unless you're married. Just want you to know. <laughs> I see, I visualize this. <sighs> Not unless you're married, of course. <laughs> I love that line. Some people have this idea that, um, that the Bible does not say anything about sex before marriage being an infamania, as we say in Italian, or a sin. Make no mistake about it. Young folk, you can talk yourself into it all you want. You can make believe fornication is not pornography. Fornication is two people who have not before, gone before God and man and said, I do and I will forever. That's what fornication is. And whether it's homosexual sex, heterosexual sex, or any other sex beyond that. One man, one woman is marriage before God. Before God. Outside these walls, what people do in the world, that's for the... That's for God to judge. Here's what we do in here, though. You guys understand what I'm saying? Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And if you have to so bad, if you just cannot control yourself and you've talked yourself into thinking there's nothing wrong with it, listen, it's really simple. Anybody wants to get married, you come right up here. Yeah, let's do it. Do you want to get married to this person? Do you want to get married to that person? Yes. Are you promising never to have anybody but her? Are you promising? Yes? Okay, good. Well, let's join them together. And, and, and go. then you go have your fun. But if your spouse slash boyfriend slash girlfriend slash whatever is not willing to do that, you're selling yourself out, sister. Brother, you're being deceived and tricked. It's that simple. Then some relative comes along, and he wants to throw his two cents in. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awaken you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. Then the Shulamite looks at her husband and says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. Did you hear what he just said? Now this is why I started the Bible study with where I started it. If you really want me, set me as a seal upon your heart. Now that seal, do you guys know what a seal is? Not, oh, 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 not that seal. Back in biblical times, in order to, to seal something, you've wrote a letter, you wrote a contract, you took wax and a signet ring. You burned and melted the wax and you put your ring in it and had usually your initials or your family crest or something in there. Boom. Done. Set me as a seal. Don't abuse me. You've enraptured my heart. You've won my love. Go the rest of the way. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm for love is as strong as death. Boy, can you hear God saying that to you? Isn't that what the Lord Jesus says to us? Set me as a seal upon your heart. Set me as a seal upon your arm. Not just the inside, but the outside. For my love is stronger than death. What a great line that is. What an amazing line. Didn't, didn't we worship to that song just the other day? Was that today? Or was that the other night? It's a great line. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the flood drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would, it would utterly be despised. Whatever it is that my in-laws want so that I can keep my wife my wife, it's nothing. I would do it. 
If my wife was to get into a boat and, and, and go to the farthest ends of the earth, it wouldn't stop my love for her. There is no flood that can drown my love for my wife. It's none. It's not going to happen. And if I had to pay to win her back, to get her back, it's an old saying, it's a funny story, and I don't know if it fits, but it's worth telling because I, rem I, rem I remembered it the other day. True story. Chuck Smith, I believe it was Chuck Smith, one of these pastors was out with a friend of his who's a doctor. And they go out to a restaurant. It's a bagel place, I think they said. Was, they was eating a bagel. And a guy two tables down gets up. And he starts waving around. And the doctor runs over, puts him in the Heimlich, boom, pops that thing out. Oh, thank you so much. And the guy says to him, hey, let me, thank you so much. You saved my life. Let me buy you breakfast. He goes, nah, it's not necessary, man. Well, can I give you something? He looks at him without, because I guess he's a doctor, and he says, give me what it was worth when you were choking. <laughs> when you're choking to death, what will you pay? After the thing's out, it's like, yeah, I'll buy you breakfast. <laughs> Maybe. Love ain't like that. There's, there's, I spend way too much money on my wife. Way too much money. Look at the Shulamite's brothers. Boy, nothing's changed here. Listen to this. This is classic brother stuff. Classic brother stuff. We have a little sister. She has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she's a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. You ain't going nowhere near my sister. Look at her. Look how young she is. She what do you want? She's not even pubescent. Get away from our sister. That's good brothers right there. But look at the, the sister, the, the daughter, the Shulamite says. I am a wall, and my breasts like towers. <laughs> then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Balhaman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. And so the purity of love, it's the purity of love. Every brother sees his sister as pure and young and holy. Get away from my sister, are you? It's, no, it's time. Sometimes it's, it's time. Listen, it was a hard lesson for me. If you're, if you're a mother or a father here, Elena's courtship was no easy. You know, I was in, I was in a, a, a young, I was a young, strong father. I was voted three times at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, the scariest father. That's the truth, ask her. Everybody weren't near my daughter. It was, I didn't care. You know, at a time when everybody was playing Christian, oh, everybody wanted to be nice words. I didn't do that. You go near my daughter again, son, you're going to wind up in your father's trunk, I promise you. I'll hang your head on their door. Don't play with my daughter. I ain't the one. <gasps> did you just say that? Yeah, I just did. Yeah, you're supposed to be a Christian. All right? Play with my daughter. See how much of a Christian I am. She'll tell you. So when Austin came around, it was a setup from the Lord. He had stole my heart, my right-hand man, my best friend, my, my boy, raised him in my house. And he said to me, I really, you know, he wanted to, and this, this, he might not remember this, but I remember this. He's like, hey, Ryan, um, can we some, someday sit down and talk about it? Yeah, we'll get to that. We're going to talk about Elena one day. We're, yes, we are. Next Thursday on a day off, we'll both be home. We'll do that. I, you know, I got to take my wife out to dinner tonight. We'll talk next week about it. You know, I put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. And the first day he said to me, I think the Lord's calling me to marry your daughter. I said, you know, that's a thoroughbred there, right? That ain't no joke. You got to be stronger spiritually. You got to be wise mentally. She'll kick your butt. Are you sure that's what you want to do? I'm not, I'm not lying, guys. 
This might sound like I'm just, oh, I'm preaching. This is how I live my life. Don't you want this for yourself? Sisters, daughters here, don't you want that? Don't you want to be able to come to a brother if you don't have that at home and say, hey, this guy, he's courting me. Don't you want somebody to go and say to your, one of your prospective mates, hey, what you, what you got on your mind, son? Don't you want that? Sarah's daddy, Johnny, came to me and said, I'm lonely. It's been over a year since my wife passed. Find me a wife. I said, all right, I'll do it. And I said, man, I, I walked away. I was like, God, I ain't going to be able to do this. <laughs> you got to show up for this one. This, this, is, this is a toughie, God. <laughs> I've been given a lot of tasks in this land. Can, can I just build another barn or something like that? God showed up in the mighty ways. It's an honor when a daughter of God comes to me and says, find me a husband. I will not move without you saying so. Ground, we get the brothers of the church and go, the sister has put herself in our care and we're going to watch over her. It's an honor. To Solomon, this Shulamite says, my own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, 200. You, oh, listen. One of the ways that we looked metaphorically at this Bible study was that Solomon was a type of the world. The Shulamite was us. And Solomon was trying to tempt or tease the Shulamite to come back into the world as the world calls us. Here, the defense for this spiritualization of the text is right here, where the Shulamite looks at Solomon. You've been trying to tempt me. You've been trying to tease me. You're trying. She says, I have one vineyard. You have a thousand. And you have 200 that tend its fruit. No. One. It's enough for me. One. Go try to tempt somebody else. I love this. This woman, the Shulamite, she's not just, she doesn't just have a neck like a tower. No. She doesn't just have a nose like a bridge. No. <laughs> she's strong. She said, I'm not interested. I have my man. Then the beloved says, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions, listen for your voice. Let me hear it. And the Shulamite says, and this is how it closes, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of the spices. Now, the implication there of stag and gazelle is basically her saying, I want you. Come home. Now, the application is this. Ladies, if every time your man walks in the door, all there is is darkness and complaining, all there is is misery, at some point in time, it's like, who wants to go home anymore? When your husband comes home, yeah, we know you've had a hard day. You both had a hard day, and he might not know it. You've been taking care of kids all day. You've been cleaning the house all day. Maybe you've been running your business all day. But if your husband gets home, and it's nonstop complaining and whining, and you take care of this and you do that now, don't be surprised if he doesn't want to come home. He comes home, you did it, baby. Another day, the world did not beat you. Come in here. Come in here. You sit down, I'm going to feed you the best meal you ever had. That sounds stupid to some of you guys, but let me tell you something. You want your man to come home at 3 in the afternoon instead of 6 at night? You treat him like that once in a while. Hey, baby, I'm going to work late. Do you have to? Yeah, I have to. Well, why do you think he always has to work late? 
I'm not trying to come down hard on nobody here. I'm just trying to tell you. If this is our background for love and we look metaphorically at all the different ways it exists, metaphorically speaking, this is what we're looking at. And if any guys want to take that last part, but not the rest of the part, shame on you. Make sure the other part, too. Make sure you only have eyes for your wife. Make sure you're constantly telling her how beautiful she is. Make sure you're enraptured with her. And after that, after you've done all those things, if you get home and all it is is complaining, and oh, you, what's for dinner? Poil tropical. Well, I like chicken, but three times in one week, poil tropical gets a little boring. Whew. I will never teach the Song of Solomon book again. <laughs> Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We ask you to bless us, God, that we would have learned lessons, received lessons, knowledge of how much you love us. God, thank you that just like, just like the Shulamite, you're waiting and calling us home. And we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now be ruler over many. God, thank you so much for your love. Set God, we set you as a seal upon our heart, as a seal upon our arm, inside and out, like that song we just sang. My soul cries out from the inside out. We love you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our cries, and thank you for pouring your word over us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.